Um, with that, I'd just like to ask Martin to talk to us about 2012 SEBI roadmap for photovoltaics, bigger, thinner, faster, and <coughs> Uh, thanks, Alison, and, and thanks for organising these uh, seminar series as well. I think they've been a real positive addition to the research life within the school here. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is a, is a new roadmap that's been released for how the photovoltaic industry might develop over the next decade. So these roadmaps for photovoltaics, the first one um, was released only uh, in 2010, so there's something fairly new. But within the microelectronics industry, they've been around for decades. And I think they've had a big impact on the development of the microelectronics industry in that, you know, everyone knows Moore's law and how the size of transistors halves every 18 months or whatever. Um, but the roadmap sort of maps that out. And uh, it means that manufacturers and equipment suppliers and so on can see what they have to um, deliver down the track into the future. So it focuses people on what's needed in the future and it sort of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like at the moment, um, the microelectronics industry is at a 22 nanometer node and in the year 2020, it's supposed to be at six nanometers. So, you know, people are starting to think now, how are we gonna to get to six nanometers? What type of equipment can we supply to the market in that type of time frame? So um, even though the semiconductor, even though the photovoltaic roadmap is is much um, more in, in, in its infancy and it has some clear deficiencies, I think it's an exercise that uh, warrants encouragement because it it'll help the development of the industry. Um, so the uh, the latest version of the roadmap was released just a couple of weeks ago. So I thought I'd take this opportunity to just sort of describe the type of things that the roadmap talks about and where it thinks the industry might be heading over the next um, uh, decade. It mainly deals with silicon. Um, these, are, these are the authors of the roadmap and the little arrows I put against people that I, I could clearly recognize were not Europeans. So it's a very uh, European orientated roadmap for photovoltaics and being so it focuses on silicon and I was just at NREL last week and I saw a version of the roadmap where the international here was crossed out and European was written in in pencil so they obviously thought there wasn't enough thin film work or whatever in there um, so it has a bit of a, a European flavor although um, this, this version at least had some um, input external to Europe whereas the previous version was almost exclusively European so um, they're now seeking uh, broader input into producing the roadmap, which I think is uh, you know, a positive development. But first off, I just thought I'd go over how the industry went last year. We've got the figures in for production volumes and things um, from last year. So I just thought I'd very quickly go over that. But this is just the new electricity generation capacity added over the last few years for photovoltaics, wind, nuclear, and um, gas turbines. Uh, and you can see the photovoltaics has sort of uh, come from nowhere. And it's now getting quite close to wind in terms of the amount that's going in. So it's close to becoming the largest source of renewable based electricity generation. In fact, most of that wind, you know, 40% of it went into China. So China's really installing wind in a big way. Um, so this huge chunk here went to China. In photovoltaics, the amount of uh, photo photovoltaics going to China is growing quickly. It was the third largest uh, user of photovoltaics last year, but relatively speaking, it's a smaller amount. But if you look at outside China, there's, there was actually more photovoltaics installed worldwide than wind last year. So a um, bit of a turning point. Um, China's use is expected to pick up as two gigawatts last year. They're expecting about five gigawatts this year. So growing very rapidly, It'd be one of the strongly growing markets if things go to plan. But where's it all going to end up? And this is the most uh, positive output outlook from the German Advisory uh, Council on Global Change released a few years ago. But this is primary energy use. And they see a future where, you know, um, solar is the only resource large enough to be able to sustainably provide future energy supplies. So they see a future dependent on solar because there's nothing else out there that could possibly supply energy on that scale sustainably. That, um, that roadmap there, you can see, you know, like it's hard, hard to see the solar, like even the wind um, at the present point in time is quite a minis minuscule little segment of that graph. But if you drag out the figures and plot it on a log logarithmic scale, this is the installed capacity foreseen in that roadmap versus time. The red lines show the figure from the roadmap. So they saw wind and photovoltaics 
going up 10 times every decade in terms of the amount installed. So that was sort of a realistic constraint they imposed upon the growth of the industry. You can see that wind is um, more or less st you know, um, sticking to the plot. It's growing at about 10 times per decade in terms of the amount installed. But photovoltaics have got way ahead of its timeline. So it's now about five years ahead of the time scale. So if the technology can keep the left of this line, by 2050, you'll be 25% of the world's primary energy. So off to a good start in reaching that type of target. This was a German study, so it wasn't very keen on nuclear, but nuclear, uh, in fact, has been um, the, the renaissance that we hear so much about really hasn't happened. In Germany now, starting to be quite substantial amounts of photovoltaics. So this is a plot from um, May last year, just showing day by day across Germany, the demand upon the German power grid and how that was supplied by different technologies. So it was about 60 gigawatt total demand upon the grid. Um, and, um, you know, this is just the day by day variation. The grey shows the um, electricity supplied by the conventional nuclear and coal and gas generators. Um, the green shows the amount provided by wind, and at this date, uh, Germany had about 27 gigawatts of wind installed. And the yellow shows the photovoltaics, which had, where there was about 17 gigawatts installed then. So you can see photovoltaics really perform very well. Um, and I think once this sort of type of performance becomes more generally known, like within the power industry and amongst power engineers and so on, it's going to um, make it easier for photovoltaics to be accepted as a, as a sort of predictable source of um, energy for the power grid. Um, you can see that the photovoltaic sort of takes up the peak in the demand, the daily peak in demand matches it very well within the German system. Um, this day here, the Monday the 9th, was the day of peak demand during May in Germany and at the time of the peak demand, 62 gigawatts, more than 20% was provided by photovoltaics. Over the whole month it was about 8%. You can see with wind it's a little bit uh, scattier in that you know, some days you get virtually nothing. And other days, you know, this is a weekend period where the power being supplied by the wind is not that useful. So, you know, photovoltaics tend to get lumped with wind in terms of, you know, being an unpredictable, renewable source of energy. But in reality, it's very predictable. Like, this wasn't a fine month. I think there was 14 days of rain. But the combined output from all over Germany combines to give a very predictable, smooth sort of contribution to the total power supply. Most of these systems are small, you know, housetop and, and systems on barns and things like that. Um, this year in May, there'll be about 25 gigawatts of photovoltaics installed. So it'll be interesting to see what this May looks like. The, the, the photovoltaic systems are pretty quiet in Germany over winter because of the, you know, the, the low altitude of the sun and so on. But um, this is just a, a plot from Tuesday of the power output there. And I think that's probably a record for the photovoltaic contribution. This was about 13 gigawatts contributed here and it's already exceeding it this year. So. If we redo this plot for this year, um, yeah, we're going to see a bigger photovoltaic contribution, quite obviously. And you can see that there's still a ways to go. Like you can, you know, what it's doing is sort of clipping the power that has to be supplied by conventional generators. And you can see you can still clip it a, a bit more. So you could have two or three times as much photovoltaics within the grid until you start sort of, um, g uh, you know, digging below this um, little peak here. Um, Germany's committed to having 52 gigawatts installed by 2020, so it will have three times as much installed by then. Uh, this is just the learning curve plotted in terms of the cost of electricity, log of the cost of electricity from photovoltaics versus the accumulated capacity here. You know, the interesting thing here is that um, today we're just on the verge of the range of electricity prices associated with conventionally supplied electricity. So we're, we're reaching grid parity at the retail level, you know, so countries that have um, you know, up the upper range of retail electricity prices for Sydney, although this is looking pretty low by Sydney standards these days. Um, so I think we're at retail grid parity here in Sydney now. Um, and in many other places of the world, um, we are as well. But interestingly, if we can follow this learn learning curve, continue following it for the next eight years or so, get a terawatt of photovoltaics installed, <coughs> Presently got about um, 70 gigawatts installed, but we can get a, a terawatt installed by the end of the decade. You know, we come out the other side, so we can be lower in cost than coal-generated electricity. Now that might sound a bit unusual, but 
uh, generate elect electricity from coal isn't really all that simple a process. And you know, 100 years ago, when it, that technology was in its infancy, only the very rich could afford coal-generated electricity. It's just been the century of development that's gone into, you know, scaling up the equipment and refining the whole thing, building mines on coal fields, etc. That's allowed us to get very low-cost electricity from fossil fuels. You know, but photovoltaics are basically simpler. Stick a panel out in sunlight. So I, I don't think it'd be surprising if photovoltaics did emerge out the other side here as one of the cheaper electricity generation options. Costs have certainly been coming down. This is the average selling price, wholesale selling price for, for um, you know, the last few years shown along here. So in 2008, the average selling price was three or $4 a watt. And then uh, at the end of last year, it got down to a dollar a watt. So it's come down a factor of four or so over that three or four year period. So dropping very rapidly, that's the prices. Um, the roadmap has a little bit to say about this, or at least the earlier version, the second edition in this time last year, had this as um, an unnormalized plot, but fitting it to the actual data, you get this type of projection for how the costs might decrease over the coming decade. So, um, you know, if, you, if um, photovoltaics follows the roadmap scenario, it should be down to 60 cents of what manufacturing costs by the end of the decade. This is, um, you know, uh, investment groups tracking the actual manufacturing costs of some of the key manufacturers. And, um, you know, some are, are below this um, roadmap um, estimates. Um, sudden power here is above, you know, a high efficiency, more expensive technology. But um, you know, it's very likely the leading manufacturer will get even lower over the coming decade, down to about 50 cents a watt. And the roadmap sort of outlines the changes in technology that are needed to um, follow this sort of projection. And you know, we'll, what I'll do now is go over those. And you know, like I think the, the projection that costs are going to reduce is quite uh, realistic and probably of this um, order. So we start with the polysilicon and, the, and a lot of new plants going in China. So this is a big um, uh, LDK plant in Xinyu, um, which, which is typical of the new capacity that's going in that's helping to drive down the polysilicon costs. The polysilicon manufacturing used to be dominated by microelectronic companies that um, were keeping the prices sort of artificially high. But with all these new manufacturers now entering the market, the um, the supply has increased and the costs are coming down very rapidly. So there's a bit of a, um, this is just showing again, the polysilicon prices, US dollars per kilo up this axis, and this is just um, quarter by quarter progress in that. So uh, pre-2009, we had a silicon shortage and the price was up, you know, several hundred dollars a kilogram, come down very rapidly. And this was a forecast, I guess, made about now, about here. Um, you know, price is coming down to $30 a kilo by the end of this year. But just last week, the average price was $25 a kilo. So costs of the polysilicon have come down very quickly, and that's um, helping to drive down the manufacturing cost of the photovoltaic modules, because that polysilicon price is still a, you know, reasonably large contributor to total costs. This is just a, a stack showing the cash cost. So this is the incremental cost of manufacturers to produce polysilicon, and each of these blocks represents a separate manufacturer. So these black ones use the fluidized bed reactor, so they'd be REC, which have um, you know, the lowest cost of production because it's a, it's a simpler, less in energy intensive process. So some manufacturers have cash costs of about $15. You know, um, several have uh, cash costs below the $25, so you, you've got to sell at least at your cash costs or your you know, recipe for disaster. But you can see that some of the smaller manufacturers that have um, entered the field recently are struggling in that they're very difficult for them to produce at these type of costs. So there's a huge consolidation going on in the industry where a lot of these smaller players are sort of being frozen out of the industry. And these larger players are expanding capacity to, because they can sell profitably at this type of price, whereas these can't. So different technologies, um, the dark blue color, there's one there. I think there's another one over here somewhere. That's upgraded metallurgical grade silicon, which has the potential to be even lower cost if you can um, get good results from the lower grade of material involved. OK, now looking at the converting of this is the pure silicon. You put it in a crucible like this to um, convert it into a um, 
an ingot by directional solidification. So these ingots have been growing, so there's a small one there, bigger, biggest, um, is, is the shot of, a better shot of the same ingot. So in 2000, like this was a, a big ingot by any one standard, and then 2004 it had sort of grown and grown again by 2006. This is about the size that's now used commercially, so you know, it takes it takes you know five or six years to get something that's demonstrated you know one off you know into routine production i guess that's sort of the time lag that's been involved with this uh, type of approach uh, now there's been 800 kilo ingots done this is the size of crucible that some manufacturers are using so one meter but this is an obvious uh, route to reducing the cost of the silicon wafers in that um, you know as you make these bigger you get a higher throughput of material and you reduce the cost of consumables and so on. And you can also make better material, as I'll explain. This is what the second edition of the roadmap said. So the, the um, green squares here, you know, now we're five or six hundred dollar five or six hundred kilogram ingots, but expecting to go up to um, above a thousand kilograms by the end of the decade. The uh, present uh, blocks, uh, present ingots are called uh, generation five, which means you can slice it into five by five bricks shown here. So you get 25 bricks out of one of those blocks. And then these are subsequently sawn into wafers. Um, so a transition to generation six is imminent, where you go six by six, so a much bigger block, and then a jump to generation eight. The, the most recent roadmap was a little bit more conservative uh, it, this is the same thing, and I'll explain what these colours mean shortly, but the green means it's technology already available, the yellow means it's technology demonstrated but not yet used commercially. Um, so, um, you know, quicker growth in the near term and then for some reason stabilisation, but I, I don't think that's going to occur. I think, you know, bigger is going to be cheaper and everyone will just be pushing to get bigger and bigger ingots. So I think the Second edition of the roadmap was probably more realistic in, in projecting um, you know, how people are going to embrace these bigger and bigger bricks. The other thing that's occurred, um, you know, I said that going to these bigger blocks, you get better material. And one thing that's happening in this area is the production of, by this directional solidification, a process, a quasi mono material. So you stick a seed um, layer at the bottom of the material before you melt it and then um, you can grow the crystalline material from the seed. So um, whereas this approach traditionally produced uh, multi-crystalline material, it's now being optimized to produce essentially monocrystalline material. Uh, I pinched a lot of um, slides from uh, Darren Yang's group at Zhejiang University. But you can, um, with this process, you can, you can nucleate crystalline material in the central regions of the ingot. You still get multi-crystalline material around the edges. But as you go to bigger and bigger blocks, you know, the fraction of crystalline to multi-crystalline um, keeps increasing. Uh, this is just a top view showing, um, you know, the multi-crystalline region around the edge, and then you've got essentially crystalline material in this middle region. So this technology is very much in its infancy. It wasn't mentioned in the second edition of the roadmap, so it's some, a new entrant for this, um, for this present version. The, uh, a lot of the developmental work had been occurring in Asia and the Europeans weren't aware that there was so much activity uh, in the area. But to produce the seed for crystallization, um, you know, what is done, I think this is the main technique, is to grow a monocrystalline ingot by the traditional Krakowski process, square it off and then cut it up into these little blocks. They're about two centimeters thick, so you know, much thicker than a conventional wafer, and then just stack them around the bottom or you can cut the ingot the other way. So 840 centimetres, so quite a big ingot, cutting it longitudinally to reduce the number of layers in the bottom. The other thing you can do is just cut the bottom off this ingot here and use that to seed the growth of the next ingot. Uh, this just shows um, you know, more details. These are the, you know, these things laid out. In actuality, the polysilicon material stacked on top and that's just a schematic of what's going on. Um, when you look at the quality of the material that's produced, you get these um, uh, multi-crystalline regions around the edge that I already mentioned, but it turns out if you use the seeding approach, you tend to get increased density of dislocations around the edge of these seeds. So that, um, this, you know, the discontinuity at the edge of the seed sort of creates defects in the growing material that you can see in the, 
in the propagating material. But I think with time, as people get better at doing these things, they'll find ways of reducing the density of those or better ways of producing the seed and so on. Um, you know, that will gradually improve the quality of this type of material. The other thing that um, at the moment adds to the cost of this material is that you get what's called this large red zone around the um, bottom of the ingot. So with a traditional multi-crystalline ingot, you get a red zone. So this is just a region of low um, quality of the material, low carrier lifetime due to diffusion of, of iron primarily from the crucible into the material. So you get this heavily contaminated region around the edge that you, um, you, you saw off the ingot and toss back into the melt or dispose of some other way. Um, but uh, with this um, monocrystalline material, you tend to get a much thicker layer here. And um, I don't think the process is, is fully understood, but you tend to get two peaks in the iron. So this is the uh, distance from the bottom here, so working up in this direction. This is the iron concentration with a zero here. So you get iron diffusing from the crucible, which is this bit of the iron, but there's iron sort of trapped in the melt and due to the dynamics of the growth process, you get this additional peak of iron there. So you generally start the growth very quickly because the challenge with this approach is to um, nucleate the molten material growth from the seed without melting the seed away. So it needs a bit of finicky um, start up to the growth process. So you generally grow the material quite quickly so you can get the nucleated from the seed without melting the seed and then you slow down and this iron hump has something to do with that slowdown. Um, when you look at the quality of cells that are made from the material, this is the efficiency versus a uh, different uh, material across here. So this is the conventional Schakowsky monocrystalline material. And generally you use an alkaline etch to produce pyramidal texture on the top surface. So the cell looks like this, nice and dark. Um, so in production now, you know, this type of figure is quite traditional, 17 and a half to 18 and a half type efficiency is fairly typical production figures for the monocrystalline material. With multi-crystalline material, this, this conventional casting process without the seeding, you tend to get, uh, what has it got here? Mid 15s to high 16 sort of efficiency range. So somewhat lower efficiency and perhaps a bigger spread due to the bigger variability in the material quality. Um, because this is all different orientations, like, like around this region here, all the crystals are differently orientated, you can't use this alkaline texturing, so there's acidic texturing used. So that gives a less reflective surface in air. Um, so you don't, um, it's not quite as uh, good at absorbing the light as, um, as the alkaline texturing. And this is the quasi single crystal or, mo or the, um, the cast mono material where you use a seed here. So this is the efficiency range you get. So getting close, you know, the best material is very close to the best of the uh, standard monocrystalline material. The worst is, um, you know, below the worst of the monocrystalline material, but a big jump over the multi-crystalline material shown here. That's if you use an alkaline etch, which you can because you can control the crystal structure. If you use an acidic etch, you lose something through the reduced reflection as shown here. So slightly lower efficiencies there. When you encapsulate the cells into modules, these acidic etched ones tend to catch up a little bit because the, the glass layer on top helps reduce reflection from the, of some of the reflected light. So that just gives you an idea, but I think as this material improves, it'll catch up to the monocrystalline material and it could even get ahead because the uh, oxygen levels in the material are a lot lower than in the standard Schakowsky process. So, you know, it's got potential to be at least as good and possibly better. The previous issue of the roadmap uh, was unaware of this, all this work that was happening and um, it didn't even mention mono, but it, this mono-like material, but it's taken a sort of complete 180 degree turnaround now and it sees the mono-like material going from almost nothing at present, building up very rapidly at the expense of the multi-crystalline material, which is going down very rapidly. So um, the roadmap is sort of foreshadowing this transition. The um, quasi-mono material is a little bit more difficult than it, than it sounds, so um, I'm not sure if this will happen as quickly, but it certainly is an avenue to uh, improving the quality and reducing the cost. The mono material is fairly static. The conventional mono material is fairly static in this, um, in this forecast. The next thing is soaring, and 
Um, this is another area where I think we'll see big improvements over the coming decade. But generally, something like piano wire is used to, um, uh, to guide the abrasive through the, the um, brick to uh, saw it into individual wafers. So this is a close-up of the presently standard approach where the piano wires, and this piano wire might be you know, several kilometers long, uh, its role is to guide this um, liquid slurry, um, just to guide where, it, where the pressure uh, is applied to the wafer and hence cut it. It's cut through the wafer, cut through the uh, brick very um, steady, slowly and steadily. Um, the transition that occurring there is going from this slurry based approach to a diamond impregnated wire, such as indicated here. So these are all little diamonds, those white specks there. And um, the advantage is you can do it about, you can cut much quicker and you can also um, reduce, particularly uh, this loss here, this material that's wasted during the cutting process is the kerf loss. So you tend to end up with higher kerf loss with this process than with this one here. So the diamond has the advantage of being quicker and also um, uh, reducing the wastage of the silicon during the cutting process. Um, at the moment, there's a bit of a problem in that if this material is multi-crystalline material, it can have precipitates within it due to that casting process. You sometimes get little clumps of silicon oxide or silicon nitride or silicon carbide you know, within this material. And if these blades bump into that, these ones are more likely to break than these ones here. So that's the technical challenge that's being overcome at the moment. Um, so this is what the roadmap is saying about the share of production that's likely to be um, um, switched to this process over the coming decade. So going from almost nothing to 100% for the monocrystalline material. The monocrystalline material tends to have less of these precipitates, precipitates so it's a bit easier. And then with just a slight delay, uh, most of the multi-crystalline material that forecasting will be cut by this process. So that's an opportunity for reducing the costs of soaring the wafers from the bricks. Um, so this was the second edition, the, the, where I've got the green here, so that's a previous year's one. So this was the um, wafer thicknesses that were being projected, so the thickness of this bit here. So, um, you know, 180 microns, um, 160 to 180 at the moment, going down to 100 microns by the end of the decade. Um, yeah, these little colors here is just like a traffic sign sort of code. The green means it's an uh, industrial solution exists. The yellow means it's known but not yet being used in mass production. The orange is solution is known but some problems with it. And red is completely unknown. So you know, this is a you know, roadmap saying we're going to be at 100 microns by 2020, but we know, don't quite know how to get there. So this provides an incentive for people to start thinking about, you know, we need 100 microns by 2020. How are we going to do that? What type of equipment do we need to develop? The present uh, version of the roadmap is a little bit less bullish. It's saying 120 by um, 2020. And, and, and I think that's a reflection of the decreased price for polysilicon that makes the um, you know, the, the efficient soaring of the material less important in the overall economics. So, you know, relaxation in the time scales as a result of that um, reduction in cost of polysilicon. The kerf loss also um, 100 microns by 2020 um, in the old roadmap. The new version is broken it down into the curve loss for the slurry base slicing, which tends to be larger. So 120 microns for the slurry base, but with the wire, diamond wire based soaring, that's where the advantage is going to come, as well as the quicker cutting. So in a nutshell, if you um, add the wafer thickness and the um, kerf loss, you get the total thickness that's consumed per wafer. So at the moment, you can cut 32. You know, For a block like this, you can get 32 wafers a centimetre of that block. Um, by 2020, you should be able to get 42 wafers per centimetre using the present slurry process, or even more using the diamond. So, you know, like just getting more wafers from each of these blocks is obviously going to lower the cost of each wafer. Um, the final area that the roadmap talks about is, um, is efficiency, and that's a, a key mechanism for leveraging the cost of the modules. And this is just the chart I'm sure you've all seen before of laboratory efficiency level evolution over the last 70 years. Um, when our group got involved in the mid 70s, this was the latest and greatest solar cell, which was the black solar cell that was developed for space use. So it had caused a big jump 
in the efficiency of the, of the standard silicon cells, mainly by this um, alkaline texturing. Well, it was hydrazine based, so not really alkaline, I guess, but this texturing of the surface of the cell to produce the pyramidal structures here. Um, and also the use of back surface fields was a, a you know, roughly contemporary uh, development that um, uh, allowed the high recombination at this rear contact to be isolated from the main cell body by this uh, heavily doped region. So they were the two uh, technical improvements. If you look at a present commercial cell, this is just my standard diagram for commercial cell, it's truly really just a black cell with a different metallization approach. So, you know, basically the technology that, and this metallization approach was developed at roughly the same time as the black cell. So, so really the technology being used in the mainstream of commercial cells that are done all, made all this progress in reducing costs and everything is technology that was well and truly around in the 1970s. So it's just been refinement of that technology that's resulted in a huge uh, evolution in costs that we've seen. Um, we've got all this improvement um, here yet to capture in commercial cells. Uh, our group here made the first 20% efficient cell. This is the uh, members of the team that did that. You might recognize some faces there. So some are still around. Um, so, um, and, and most have gone on to make a big impact upon the, upon the industry. Um, our, our, our run of record efficiencies was interrupted by um, Stanford University that produced this uh, unusual structure here. I used to joke that, you know, in the Southern Hemisphere, you know, we're up, up the other way and the sun comes from the top of the cell rather than the bottom, as they've got shown in this drawing here. But the cell's unusual in that it does have both contacts on the back. But technically, the interesting thing is that it needed to have both the back surface and the top surface very low recombination activity to be able to make that cell design to work. So it was the first cell where a lot of attention was paid to improving the quality of both the front and the back cell of the side of the cell. That cell is now in production uh, with SunPower, the most efficient commercial cell, and the efficiencies being produced in production are um, it's the right way up this time, but the efficiencies being produced in production are actually slightly higher than you know, the record cell that was demonstrated in the lab all those years ago. So this gives you a bit of confidence that you know, the industry will be able to follow this path as well, and uh, you know, we'll see 25% cells in production eventually. Um, the sun power cell is quite interesting, you know, this is the front side, no contact on it, all the contacts on the back, but uh, you'll notice that these um, fingers, there's uh, interleaved um, polarity of fingers going, one's going this way and one's going the other way. So it's really a, a cell design with very long finger length, and um, that means you need a lot of metal to be able to carry, uh, you know, the full current of this cell over this distance. So um, when SunPower were developing this cell, they couldn't use silver for the metallization because you just needed too much of it. It would have been too expensive even at previous you know, uh, prices of silver of yesteryear. Um, so they used largely copper as the conductor in this metal. So it's quite an interesting structure from that point of view. SunPower's already broken free of the need for silver, which um, the rest of the industry still sort of needs. Um, Onwards, and then this is of course our 25% efficient cell, which I think um, industry will eventually be able to reproduce that type of performance if the sun power example is any precedent. Um, laser dope selective emitter cell, I guess is, is our best take on the way of transferring some of these high efficiencies into production. It also has the advantage of um, getting rid of the silver metallization. So I think that makes it doubly attractive at the moment. I, th I think you're all familiar with the way that works, so I won't go over that. Um, and then you're probably also familiar with the recent 20.3% result um, developed uh, by SunTech in conjunction with the university, where attention is also paid to the rear. So this is now getting into the next bit of the efficiency evolution curve, not just paying attention to the front surface of the cell, which the previous structure did, but also paying attention to how you um, reduce the electronic activity at the rear surface of the cell, and that's essential to take you, you know, past 22% onto the 25% figure. So that's an important step, that particular result. Um, other approaches that other groups have developed, this is the HIT cell developed by uh, Sanyo, which just uses a crystalline um, silicon wafer, N-type rather than the normal P-type, doped with uh, phosphorus. And then it just uses amorphous silicon technology to uh, 
deposit a heterojunction structure on the front and on the rear. So it's more like sort of 3.5 type of technology where you can control the band gap of the semiconductor. Um, gives very low um, recombination velocities at these interfaces here and uses con conducting oxides um, and uh, sort of amorphous silicon type technology to uh, contact. Also bifacial, so it has some nice features about it. The downside tends to be that these amorphous silicon layers absorb some of the light and, um, and uh, are unable to contribute to the cell output. So it's just a parasitic absorption that you don't get in some of the other high efficiency structures. A lot of interest in um, rear contact cells, as we'll see, particularly in this roadmap. So this is one way of making rear contact. The Stanford cell is, is, is one way, it just relies on the quality of the material, allowing the photogenerated carriers to diffuse to the rear. This one uh, doesn't require as good a quality um, material. You just have a conducting path um, from the front to the back through little laser drilled holes, such as shown here. So both contacts are on the back. And that probably has an advantage when you come to assemble modules from these cells. You don't have to take the interconnect from back of the cell to the front of the next one. You can just sort of lay the cells out and contact everything from the rear. So in principle, um, you know, the big attraction of the rear contact cells is ease of moduling, lower costs for moduling. And the metal wrap through cell, very similar, except you use metal to increase the conductivity of this top layer. So this provides parallel conductive paths to the to the vias and metal through the vias, and that just reduces the resistance you know, of this uh, carrier transport, and you can have these holes further apart is the end result, so uh, a cheaper structure because of that. The roadmap is quite keen on these, um, on rear contact cells. So this was the second edition, you know, the share of rear contact cells is a, fract a fraction of worldwide production. So fraction of production here, about 5%, they reckon at the moment, and then going up to 40% of total production by 2020. So very enthusiastic about rear contact cells, um, you know, which is a, a sort of a European, the European influence coming out in the roadmap, I believe, because some of the labs like ECN are very positive about these rear contact cells. Uh, in the present version of the roadmap, they've got a little bit less optimistic. They've dropped it back from 40% to 35%, but still a huge fraction of total cell production, um, which I believe is unlikely um, to eventuate. I think the key pressure will be on improving the efficiency of the cell, and then maybe if you've saturated and you've got to your 25%, maybe you'll then look at ways of taking cost out by going to a rear contacts design. Um, this is... Um, so some of the cell structures, um, both the Stanford University, the high efficiency structure there and the HIT cell use N-type wafers. So this is the uh, share of N-type dope wafers um, foreshadowed in that uh, roadmap. So they saw uh, of the uh, monocrystalline market, you know, up to 50% of the market by 2020 being um, N-type wafers for the mono wafers, a very much smaller fraction for the multi-crystalline material. The, uh, surprisingly to me, the latest version has got even more bullish on the n-type material, so taking it up to 65% by 2020 for the monocrystalline material. So their, their thinking here will become a little bit apparent in some of the later slides. Um, but basically it's because the mono is um, you know, consistent with um, implementing some of the, the HIT cell and the Stanford uh, or SunPower cell in particular, and they see those as having a large share of the future market. Um, this was the second edition uh, estimate of where the cell efficiencies might be, so quite modest in their extrapolation, so 20% cell efficiency for mono material by 2020, and we've seen that Suntech's already demonstrated that in commercial grade material um, now, and then the um, multi-crystalline going up to 18 and a half, is it? Yeah, 18 and a half, which is quite challenging, but um, you know, possibly uh, doable. The latest version has sort of broken down into more detail. So they have this high efficiency strand going up here. Um, and it's the, um, this one here, the mono silicon end type. So the, the roadmap is for shadowing a, a changed end type wafers to capture this high efficiency potential here going up to 23.5% by 2020 but still maintaining quite modest expectations for mono p-type, so only just sort of crawling over 
Whereas I think um, you know, in the laboratory, 25% has been demonstrated with the p-type. So you know, that's um, you know, where this could very well end up. Maybe not by 2020, but at some point in time. They also have the mono-like silicon introduced in this slide, so gradually catching up to the pure mono material, as shown here. And then uh, somehow they've bumped up the multi-crystalline silicon, so now 19.5% efficiency by 2020. I'm only aware of two groups in the world that have ever done over 19.5% efficiency with multi-crystalline silicon on small one square centimeter cells. So this is a bit of a stretch, I, I think. Um, in terms of the module, you use, lose a bit of performance when you go to modules. So they talk about um, the performance of a standard module with 66 inch square cells, 156 millimeter cells, which has an area, you know, 1.6 to 1.7 square meters typically. So, um, you know, going from the, the, the con conventional modules now are 14 to 15 percent efficiency, but incremental improvements, um, you know, going up 16, 17 percent by the end of the decade. That was the previous version of the roadmap. I've dropped a slide out here. The, the latest version, uh, I won't bother um, trying to fiddle with it, but this is the latest version here. I've just um, dropped, oh, maybe it's the next one. No. I've uh, dropped out one of the slides I meant to keep in there, but they see um, the mono N type, the 23.5 resulting in modules of 20.5% efficiency and um, also improvements in these efficiencies here to close to 18 and over 17% for the, for the multi. So this just shows um, you know, historical average efficiency. So it has been going up quite steadily um, with time. And then you know, this is more or less a fairly conservative projection of what's already been demonstrated when you look at it in this slide here. Slightly different averages of the monos involved here. So there's a discontinuity there. This is the best commercial module, so you can now buy modules over 20% efficient, which is the um, you know, expectation for the average modules made from N-type silicon wafers by 2020. OK, I haven't got too more to, many more to go. Um, just talking about the cell design, and here they're, they're still, you know, even though they're, they're talking about rear contact cells and everything, I think in, in this bit of their roadmap, they're thinking very much in terms of the conventional type of cells. So finger width, you know, going down now, I've got 120 to 150. I keep dragging this down on my slides, but haven't been able to keep up with reality. They're saying we're now you know, 80 to 90 microns for a standard finger width, um, but that'll go down to 30 micron finger width by 2020, although the red shows we don't know how to do that. Although I think we've got some ideas here. Um, what says this is the silver per cell. So that's been a big issue with the silver price rising so quickly last year. So plans are to dump as much silicon as you can out of the cell. Again, not too sure exactly how that might happen. Um, but plans are to get rid of silicon from the cell um, over the coming decade. And then this uh, top sheet resistivity of this diffused layer here, um, you know, presently they reckon 80 to 90 ohms per square, although that sounds a bit high for me for the average in production, and then going up to 120. So by reducing the uh, number of dopants in this layer, you can improve its quality and the cell performance consequently. They've gone to a fair bit of detail. So this is very European going into Femto amps per square centimetre for the various cont contributions to J0 at the diode saturation current density. So broken it down into that. So the bulk, the front and the rear. So big improvements in the rear um, passivation compared to the rest. So that is in line with going to that double side geometry that I talked about before. I think it's easier to think in terms of voltages. So if you add these up, you get a voltage limit of 613 at 2010 aiming for only 653 by 2020. I think probably industry will be doing better than that by then. Um, and this is the next, this was the old version of the roadmap. This is the latest version, pretty much the same story. So the final bit, I'll just talk about my thoughts of where the silicon technology might uh, eventually end up. So I guess what the recent years have shown is the costs have come down more quickly than anyone expected. And uh, it's making it very difficult for new technologies, particularly thin film technologies, to compete on the marketplace. Like it was just announced um, 
First Solar, who for years now has been the market leader in terms of manufacturing costs, is scaling back its production, it's closed down its German facility, it's closing down some of its lines in Malaysia and so on. Um, so they're struggling to, um, to be profitable on today's market. Um, so it, the, the, the progress with the, the reduction in the silicon costs and the potential that's still there that I think this roadmap points out to reduce them further, uh, you know, means that silicon is still likely to be the dominant technology by 2020, I think, and maybe even 2030 and so on. So if that's the case, you know, what, you know, where could you take this technology that would make sense? Um, you know, you might get to 25% efficiency, but if you go to the basic thermodynamics, converting, um, you know, global sunlight into electricity, you should be able to do it with 74% efficiency. So settling for 25% when you can, you know, in principle do very much higher doesn't sound like a technology that's matured. So how might the technology mature? So it comes close to this figure. Um, so we get into the third generation. So this is just a bar chart showing the efficiency limit for a single cell, like a silicon cell. And this is the thermodynamic limit, 74% here. The most promising way has been by stacking cells of different material on top of each other. So you go to a two cell stack, you get a 40 or 50% improvement. And then that just keeps going up as you add more and more cells to the stack. So it provides a way of incrementally um, upping the efficiency of, um, of a device. If you look at stacking cells upon silicon, so you know, the idea is you know, you've got all these very cheap, high quality monocrystalline, you know, according to the roadmap, by 2020 we'll have virtually all the wafers will be monocrystalline. Um, you've got this clean, cheap template, and um, it would be ideal for you know, growing uh, high quality cells on top of it. So if you look at the efficiency limit of stacking cells on silicon compared to having um, any material of your choice as the bottom cell, you know, this is what you end up with. This is the efficiency for a single cell. Silicon's quite close to the optimum. But if you go to a two cell stack, having silicon on the bottom is no impediment at all. It's as good as anything to have as your bottom cell. Three cell stack, pretty similar. And as you go up to more and more cells, the efficiency keeps going up, but you just keep dropping you know, incrementally further and further behind the op optimum choice. So it's a way of you know, pushing the limiting efficiency of a silicon cell from 29% up to 47%, up to 50%, and so on, just by stacking cells on the silicon. So what you need is a good technology for stacking cells onto silicon. So this is my idea of what you know, a cell of the future might look like, a, a fairly standard type of cell structure, but just this little thin layer like an extra anti-reflection coating added to the cell that is in fact is a stack of higher band gap cells. So the, the group here has started, I think there's five separate programs now in looking at different ways that you might be able to stack cells onto silicon to sort of you know, take advantage of these low cost substrates, clean substrates that are gonna be available um, from the industry in the future. So that brings to the end of the talk. You know, the re recent progress of silicon means it's gonna be even more difficult to dislodge. Um, the average selling price for the first quarter of this year was well below a dollar a watt. So uh, it's a moving target, it makes it very difficult for thin film technologies. They have to sell lower than silicon because they're lower efficiency and there's not much room below that for them to be able to manufacture. Oh, bit of a glitch, back on the line. So uh, I think it's a bit like a bicycle race. The, um, you know, this is the silicon industry here and this is um, you know, a, a different type of technology, say cadmium telluride or CIGS or whatever. The companies involved in those technologies tend to be loners. They're, they haven't got this huge industry to support them. They've got unique technology that they're protecting from their competitors. So they don't want anyone to know what they're doing. Um, whereas the silicon industry, everyone knows pretty much what the game is. And there's a huge industry working. You know, as we talk, there's someone trying to figure a way of sawing silicon thinner or casting bigger blocks or so on. You've got this huge industry all independently thinking about their own little part of the chain and how they can improve it. So, you know, it's a bit like a bicycle race where you have this breakaway, but the combined strength of the peloton, you know, eventually, you know, the breakaway may just hold out to the finish line and, and win the race. But in the photovoltaic industry, there's no finish line. You, you've just got this relentless grinding on. Um, and so I think the strength of the industry in, um, you know, in terms of the huge combination of resources that are being brought to bear to lower the costs um, mean that um, 
it's going to be very difficult for breakaways to occur. So unless they can assemble their own sort of support very quickly, uh, it's going to be difficult for them to, to, get a, to get any advantage. So where ultimately, if, if this is in fact true and silicon silic keeps on going, you know, what we really need is some way of using it as a, cl a cheap, clean substrate and stacking cells on top of it to get to from 25% to 30% to 35% to ultimately to 40% or perhaps even higher. So thanks very much for your attention. Alistair down here. He's the closest. We'll go with Alistair first. <laughs> hey Martin, thanks very much. Um, very interesting to see that price uh, way, way, way down on the pole. Do you have a feeling for the um, energy, I, I, mean, I guess the energy payback is following that price down. Do you yes. have a, any sort of feel for that energy payback period that we're headed for in the near term, say 2020? Yeah, no, as, as you mentioned, the, the cost and the energy payback are very closely uh, linked. Um, you know, in energy accounting, if you can't find out the energy content of something, you use its cost as a surrogate and you know, work, out, work out the energy content from that. Um, but um, REC recently had independently confirmed that their energy payback time is under a year, I think, for their installed modules. So they use the um, fluidized bed reactor for producing their poly, which is a lower energy process. But most of the silicon manufacturers are now year to year and a half, I would guess, um, typically for their energy payback time with the thin film module manufacturers having potential to go even lower. But I think as the, you know, the cost goes down from a dollar now to 50 cents over this decade, the energy payback time will go from a year and a half to nine months for a typical sort of manufacturer. Yeah, yeah. So one of the slides I showed was the average selling price. So that's what people are actually getting for their modules. Another was was the manufacturing cost. And um, at the moment, there is an oversupply in the industry, and, and that's one of the things that's helping to drive down the the um, price of modules is the fact that you know there are more people wanting to sell them than wanting to buy them. So uh, yeah, you're correct. The um, there if you do a full costing of the manufacturing cost of a of a module and the selling price, they're fairly much the same at the present point in time. But some of the um, leading manufacturers are now, you know, they've been under pressure to reduce their manufacturing cost and they're starting to do that. So some of the tier one Chinese manufacturers are now getting below the average selling price. There's also the issue of cash costs versus total costs. So, you know, if you've got depreciation, you have to include that in your manufacturing cost. But if you're running a business, you know, you just got to keep the cash flow balance. So, you, you know, the cash cost of the making the product is a little bit different from the manufacturing cost. So you can afford to, you know, in desperation, you can, as long as you sell above your cash cost, you might be okay. One of your very early slides, very powerful, message was that the increased capacity of nuclear coal and PV wind is over. No, no, that's, that's just capacity. So it doesn't look as good um, for the wind and photovoltaics if you do it in terms of um, uh, total, uh, you know, energy produced rather than capacity. But um, yeah, so in, in Germany, most of the photovoltaic capacity is very usefully used, as you can see from that graph. So you know, capacity yeah, might be the way, right way of thinking about it. Yeah, and I guess things like gas turbines, you know, they don't generally have a high capacity factor anyhow. So. You know, it's a bit hard to compare them in terms of energy uh, production, I think. But yeah, but, but a nuclear plant would have you know four or five times the capacity factor of a solar plant, particularly in Germany. Um, Martin, say five years ago, the balance of systems costs were, well, the module cost was put forward as maybe 50 to 60 percent of the system. Currently, it's down around 35 and 40 percent. So, in terms of your, this is a smaller system that I'm talking about. Uh, 
is that a trend that's going to, in, in, the, in other words, the module cost is really getting down to one third of the system cost. Um, what's the progress on the system cost? Yeah, no, no, it probably depends on the type of system. So, you know, I think for these big fields of panels, for example, the module cost would still be larger than the rest of the system cost. But for residential systems, you know, it probably is a third or something like that. Um, yeah, uh, there, there have been big reductions in inverter costs, and I think that will continue. So a lot of the inverters are still made in Europe and so on. And, you know, once you transfer that to that manufacturing to Asia and you get the reliability and so on into the product that customers are going to expect, you know, you, you will see inverter costs come down as the uh, industry matures as well. Um, installation costs, there's probably still some good ideas on how to more cheaply install solar panels, although a lot of progress was made in the German program, so some of those, you know, a lot of thought was put into the weight of metal and in installations and things like that, just trying to shave all the costs out of installation. But yeah, so there's probably still... Um, you know, historically, they've sort of tracked each other. You know, there's been slight changes in the balance, but you know, the, it, it isn't. Um, you know, I do have a graph somewhere that shows that you know the costs in Japan of balance of system versus modules, and you know, they all, all are coming down. Perhaps not quite the same rate, but they are all coming down. Yeah, I'm not too sure, but it, it's, the consumable costs aren't, aren't a huge percentage of the total cost of soaring. So, you know, the wastage, I guess, is a huge cost. You're throwing away all that carefully crystallized silicon material. So that's, that's one of the big losses. Yeah, yeah. So the diamond wire is um, definitely higher capital costs than the, than the diamond coated wire. But the overall economics favor the diamond because of the higher throughput and thinner wafers and all that kind of thing. And then the cost of the diamond wire will come, the cost will come down because it's a less mature product and people are going to get better at making it and find shortcuts and so on. I've got one question which is slightly different. What is your vision for PV in Australia? Because we're all in Australia here and we're worried, worried a little bit. We have so much sun and it's just not really taking off. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, um, I'm not sure, but I, but I think um, PV is a good match to the grid here. So, um, you know, the, 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 per, perhaps the positive experience such as in Germany may uh, influence some of the people within, you know, the power industry here. So I'm trying to promote that side of things when I give talks to with people like that I'd like to be in the audience. Um, but, but I think, you know, with the recent IPART finding that, you know, while you're paying 40 cents for electricity from the grid, electricity sent back the other way is only worth five to eight cents. I think that may well encourage storage uh, on private residences. So I think we might see a big boon in, you know, small scale storage over the coming five years. You know, so some, some companies are now marketing, marketing inverters with battery packs included and so on. So um, I think that could well be a a trend that grows in Australia because uh, you know the home load the home generation of photovoltaics is not well matched to the home load so it's quite a small system that you can stick in like say 500 watts is about the size a typical home could put in to um, so that they were never exporting electricity uh, just uh, just meeting the house, household load whereas most people want to put in 10 times that amount of power to generate the average um, household load. Um, I, I think uh, batteries are the only option in the near term. So there's a lot of work going on batteries for electric vehicles. Um, so you know they, they believe they can increase all the performance parameters while decreasing the cost of the batteries. Um, so I've just had a symposium on batteries and at the MRS symposium in San Francisco, and you know they were talking about you know $150 a kilowatt hour for these nickel, no sorry, this, these lithium-based batteries that were um, you know, had better performance parameters than lead acid, which were $200 a kilowatt hour. So, you know, they, they're anticipating that the development of batteries, particularly for electric vehicles, will have some flow over into uh, other areas. I think that's the most likely route. Um, at the large scale, pumped hydro is still a clear winner.
is ultimately as a clean cheap substrate for forty percent tender. But uh, uh, what is the most appropriate or practical choice for the top cell, for example? Yeah, yeah. So we, as I mentioned, we have five different projects here, and, and one is quite an old project with the silicon quantum dots as a way of using silicon-like materials. Although that was uh, uh, conceptualised more for thin film silicon rather than crystalline silicon, so I don't think that's appropriate for the crystalline material. Um, but um, Zhao, Zhao Jing and I have just started a project with CZTS, which is copper zinc tin sulphide, which is being developed as a uh, earth abundant replacement for cadmium telluride and CIGS technologies because it's very similar to those technologies in terms of materials and everything, you know, the way the materials work and so on, but it uh, doesn't involve anything toxic or, or scarce. Um, but the other interesting thing is it has a lattice constant that's very similar to silicon. So, you know, so that's, that's an area that there's very few people working on that we've started a project in. The other one is uh, one that uh, Alan Barnett, Barnett has got funding from the Australian Solar Institute to look at um, using silicon germanium layers to make a transition from the silicon lattice constant to the germanium lattice constant so you can then grow three five cells on top of a silicon wafer. Um, Steve Bremer and myself and Zhao Jing are talking to another group who's using gallium phosphide and gallium arsenide alloys to make that sort of transition in the lattice constant of the, of the material. So that's four projects. And the final project is one that Jeff Zhao started here last year where he found he could deposit very thin layers of germanium onto a silicon wafer and get a very abrupt transition in the lattice constant. Um, you know, germanium layers only 100 nanometers or so thick. We're getting an abrupt transition. And, and in theory, um, you know, you should be able to take up the lattice difference between a germanium type material and silicon in just a single atomic plane. And, you know, we thought, you know, Jeff might, might have been able to do that with the techniques he was using. But something like that would be ideal, just a very thin layer of germanium, and then you can deposit a, a cell with standard technology on top of it. But I think, I think it's a bit of an open question now. Is, you know, it has to be done very simply. Like one thing this roadmap did talk about that I didn't, um, uh, have a slide to cover was the throughput of the cells. So, you know, like one a second, and that'll get up to two a second from a standard production line, you know, by, by 2020. So you're pumping out these cells, you know, one or two a second. So everything has to be very quick. Um, so you need, you know, you need a big evolution technology to take us from where we are now to a situation where you could deposit high performance cells cheaply on silicon. But, you know, technically it's not impossible. So it's worth having a go at, I think. Yes. Uh, there are lots of uh, new emerging technologies uh, generally named curve-free wafering mm -hmm. for thin silicon layers. Do you think yes. at some point within the next 15 years they can replace conventional wafering? Yeah, I, I, think, I think everyone heard the question, but it was about uh, curve-free wafering. So, um, you know, there's two companies I'm aware of, uh, Twin, Twin Peaks, is it, and Silicon Genesis um, that are doing wafering by implanting, you know, high, I think hydrogen in one case and high energy ions in another case into, into the surface of one of those bricks and then just peeling off the silicon wafer. And there's another technique that you deposit a metal layer on the brick and it takes a bit of silicon off with it. Um, yeah, so a lot of interesting te techniques like that, but, um, you know, at the moment they're all fairly expensive, I think. So, you know, the, the proponents are very optimistic about them, but they still have a long way to go before they can uh, be put in production the type of costs you'd need to displace you know, the wire soaring. So yeah, so there's a lot of promise um, and hopefully that's the way the industry eventually goes so you don't waste all the silicon during cutting and you can cut much thinner wafers. So, you know, 50 microns or 25 microns would be enough to make a decent cell. Um, so, you know, that would be the ideal thickness to be aiming for. Thank you very much, Martin, for, for speaking to us today. I think, I think most of us found it very useful. Um, I'd just like you all to join together and thank Martin. Thank you.